So I want to start with a question. And it's a question I've asked a lot of people. I'm kind of curious what you all think about it. The question is, is the Tanakh a history book? What kind of answers are we going to have? Yes, no, sort of, not really, some discomfort maybe with the question. And then ultimately, since I'm sure there are some critical thinkers out there, you have to ask me, well, what's history? Right? We have to clarify our terms before we can really ask the question. So let's take that for a second. What is history? Break the word apart. His story. We've all heard it before. Somebody is telling the story. You know, it's interesting that it's his story and not her story because, you know, women didn't play, tend to play a dominant role in the kings and their wars that will be the classical notion of history up until basically the 20th century. But nevertheless, the word as we know it and its classical usage enters into Western thought with Herodotus, the so-called father of histories. Herodotus published the histories in the mid-15th, sorry, mid-5th century uh, before the Common Era, called the histories, and it's, um, as he self-describes, a record of his inquiry into the past. And he offers for us a few principles by which we can operate. Number one, a systematic collection of information. Right? Number two, some attempt at verification of this information, whether it's actually true or not. And number three, and to me, most importantly, he publishes it as a narrative. There's a flow of time. And his big Kiddush, the real innovation that he offers to the world, is cause and effect. That is to say, he wants to know how what is flows from what was. And this also points us toward why it was he bothered to try. Because a sense of understanding what is as it comes from what was might perhaps help us to understand what will be. Now, Herodotus, Greek, 15th century before the, com 5th century before the Common Era, still had one foot in the mythic past. What do I mean? He includes the caprice of the gods, their willful toying with humanity, as one of the primary causes of history. Now, remember, mid-5th century Greece, Socrates won't die for corrupting the youth and disbelieving the gods for at least another 50 or so years in the, in the beginning of the 4th century. Right? When Greek takes that first step out of the mythic era into its own philosophical era, we will already have his primary opponent, Thucydides. Thucydides wrote a book about the Peloponnesian War. He called it the Peloponnesian War, as you could guess. Right? And he offers to us a different model of history. I would say a modified model. Number one, critical tests of knowledge are possible and desirable. You can know in an absolute sense. Number two, he's skeptical of received knowledge. First of all, hey, people are beholden to what their parents taught them. There's no reason to believe that it's true. Number two, time obscures knowledge. Therefore, he was skeptical of anything received. Number three, we want an investigation of the truth via proofs. Thucydides tells us in his introduction, give me clear facts and I will draw clear conclusions. By the way, there's a big problem with this. My first job, or at least my first educational experience, was as a geology major. And you know what they always taught me? Geology is the ultimate observational science. And when you're trying to look at the world, and you watch the mountains here, and you see the plains there, and you try to argue how it all comes together, your biggest challenge is the idea that if I hadn't have believed it, I wouldn't have seen it. Right? Meaning, the way in which I understand the world inevitably colors how it is that I'm going to put its pieces together. We're going to leave that problem aside. We'll come back to it because tracing the arc of Western thought will be very important for what I hope to be a long and productive relationship. Now, there's one more piece that's actually quite important to understand about Thucydides. The Greeks were great lovers of art, and their literature is one of the major offerings that the Western world has to give to the future. But Thucydides drew a distinction between poetry and history. One might have been a good read, but the other one was a useful tool for understanding. All of these put together become a pillar of Greek scientific thought. The notion of objective facts, the notion of critical tests, right? the skepticism about received knowledge, right? and they all boil down to one of the primary pillars of Greek scientific thought, which in turn will become a pillar of Western scientific thought, and that is that the truth is subject to the facts. You give me the facts, and I'll tell you the truth. And conversely, if you can't do that, then don't talk to me about the truth. Now, like I said, this is the beginning of an arc of thought, right? Which will arrive ultimately at the current Western notions of truth and narrative, right? But we're going to take some time to get there. Now, we already know what the Greeks, the, what the Greeks and their intellectual inheritors 
have to say about the Tanakh. Right? Anyone who's even passingly familiar with the scholastic efforts to deconstruct the narrative of the Tanakh can add in their own knowledge. If not, when the time is appropriate, we'll discuss it. Nevertheless, I want to now look at the opposite perspective, which is, what's the Tanakh's perspective on our question? Is the Tanakh a history book? Well, we have to shift our lens. See, as much as Thucydides was looking for the truth outside of himself, the Tanakh isn't looking anywhere. In fact, it is presenting an internal truth. And as such, it will offer you facts, but only insofar as they're useful in understanding the truth. Right? Now, it's offering you a narrative, which is also true. Now, hang on a second. I'm using a word here that we also need to define. If you've figured out that when I asked you whether the Tanakh was a history book, we had to define history. So now we've got an even bigger problem, which we have to find the truth. Well, good luck with that. I mean, whole civilizations have risen and fallen without succeeding. Nevertheless, there's a, an essential distinction that we can make. Are we discussing absolute truth? Something which is objective and exists outside even of our relationship to it? Or are we dealing with um, a narrative truth? A narrative truth. So there's one which basically no one can know, the absolute. And the other which I hope, at least, that we've all experienced some sense of truth in our experience. Are we dealing with one or the other, or with both? Now, Thucydides has to distinguish. Because if you're going to say that the truth is subject to the facts, then anything which does not conform to fact cannot be true. Not in any useful sense. Right? Facts give me the conclusions. Now, the Tanakh's goal, on the other hand, is to speak the truth. And if I'm going to speak the truth, right, then whatever tools are useful to me will serve their purpose. The Tanakh, in the Tanakh, facts will be subject to the truth. In this case, I don't have to make a hard and fast distinction between what I would call the literal truth, the facts, and the literary truth. What do I mean? Has anybody ever read a good novel? Well, was it true? Not in the sense that Thucydides was speaking about, but anybody who's had the experience of an exposure to literature that resonated with the truth in them knows that absolutely it's true, whether it happened or not. That distinction, I would argue, does not exist in the mind of the Tanakh. As we chase down the thoughts of the rabbis, as they articulate their historical vision, we will see that certainly it didn't exist. Now, interestingly enough, this is strikingly similar to modern thought, right? Everybody today is interested in their subjective narrative, right? They want to argue about objective truth is essentially to waste your breath. And we're going to have to pin down how it is that the Torah is speaking of truth and the Western world's conclusion that there is only narrative are both similar and different. Now, the Torah's perspective that facts are subject to the truth is going to present us with a different problem. You know, the Torah absolutely asserts absolute truth but it does it knowingly to subjective creatures, right? And that's essentially where our story will begin. What do I mean by subjective? Well, what you had to eat this morning, how you're educated, your general experience today, what your endocrine system is saying to you right now is going to color how you understand what I'm saying and what's happening around you. Your existence is subjective. I'm sorry if I'm the first one to break it to you, right? Nevertheless, our story is not the story just of individuals. They will be important. And in fact, in my mind, I call this course Tzir Ne'aman, the faithful messenger, and the messengers who will carry the message forward through history of Israel will be critical. Nevertheless, it is not only the story of individuals. It's the story of Am Yisrael, of a people. And that story begins at Sinai. Now, what happened at Sinai? Well, go ask through cities. What would he tell you? Find the people who were there and ask them. That's a great idea, except there's only one problem. One of the classical notions of Sinai, one of the images that the Chachamim, that the sages play with, is that the mountain was in the middle, and that everyone of Am Yisrael were ringing the mountain. Now, you ever see a mountain? If you haven't, you need to get out more. Right? Anyone who's ever seen a mountain knows that it's far too big for me to understand. Now imagine I'm on the west side of the Rocky Mountains and you're on the east. I'm looking and I'm saying, you see this beautiful, rounded, brown, granite mass in the trees? Are you on the cell phone on the other side, you're saying, what are you talking about? This giant pink head wall of granite. We start to argue back and forth. Say, Which one of us is closer to the truth? Well, neither. But together, we can begin to map out 
a whole truth. You put people all the way around the mountain. You let them speak to each other. And perhaps we can come a little bit closer to the truth. And we're going to carry this image as our guide forward. And if I had to put it in words, I would say it like this. Collective experience mutes the subjectivity of existence. Therefore, the story of Am Yisrael, of the Jewish people as they travel through time, will be a story of what vessels were strong enough to hold their experience, which would allow them to articulate the truth in the Torah and the Tanakh that they received from Sinai forward. That will be our task. So, let's ask our question again. Is the Tanakh a history book? Well, now we know. Yes. No. And what is history?